everybody. I uh, just want to um, go over with you the idea of the supply side policies and the impact that has ultimately on aggregate supply. thought what I'd do first of all was just start by highlighting uh, for you some of the um, some of the key policies um, that impact on the aggregate supply curve. So from the um, from the video you just watched, you should have identified that our supply side policies have an impact on both the um, product markets, so product markets, and also the labour markets. The labour markets, of course, are well. Often we talk about the labour market as a single market, but clearly it's not. Um, there's lots of different labour markets, but it's really just the supply uh, of labour, which is um, provided by workers, of course and the demand for labour, which is, um, comes from businesses and other organisations. So in terms of the product markets, well, what are the supply side policies that impact? Well, I've, I've uh, identified about four here. The first of them here is the, the lowering or the eliminating of trade barriers. So that's getting rid of tariffs and quotas. Obviously, if, um, if tariffs are removed on imported goods or imported materials, then um, materials that are coming in from overseas that go into the production process are going to be cheaper because those taxes have been removed. And um, of course, if those are cheaper, then um, that get flows into the production process, making the cost of production cheaper and uh, increasing profit. Secondly, the Resource Management Act. We, I think we've talked about that a wee bit in class. But the idea behind the Resource Management Act is is at the moment the government's focus is on speeding up the process for resource consents. So um, any any um, extra cost that doesn't need to be there, the government's looking at taking that out. And that allows businesses to uh, gain a resource consent or gain the permission to uh, redevelop land or build factories or, or anything that might have an impact on the environment. Um, it allows it allows them to do that quicker and faster and at lower cost, and once again, that will impact on their profit. Thirdly, I've indicated I've talked about this thing called red tape. Well, red tape is just a fancy way of saying rules and regulations. You know, when businesses um, make decisions, or when even when before businesses start up, they have to go through a through a routine of uh, of um, rules and regulations. And the government's trying as much as possible to make those, um, well, make fewer rules and fewer regulations. Ultimately, that reduces cost and improves profit and improves the aggregate supply curve. Um, finally, the, th the fourth one I've indicated here is this investment in research and development. Research and development, obviously, the process where businesses go through um, identifying uh, new ways they can use resources, new methods they could use, new products they could uh, create, new markets that could be opened up. All of those things, and you can imagine that they are very high cost exercises. And often businesses have real trouble being able to afford to spend money on research and development because in the beginning it doesn't pay off any profits. And so the government, the government tends to come in where they see a good opportunity and they will invest in research and development. Now, what does this do? Well, it improves the ability of businesses in New Zealand to supply goods and services, and therefore that will move the supply curve, the aggregate supply curve, sorry, to the right. Okay, what about the labour market? How's the government operating here? Well, they're changing how unions can behave. They're ensuring that you know, unions are those organisations or groups that represent the rights of employees. Now, often in the past, unions have had a lot of power, and uh, that has meant that they can go on strike if they're unhappy with what their employers are doing. What the government's saying is, well, they've got to have that right, but that right's got to be used responsibly. And so uh, the government has changed the rules around unions to ensure that they have to go through a certain process before they're allowed to strike. Ultimately, once again, what does that do? Well. It means that in the past, of course, where, where the unions did strike, businesses had to employ other staff members to try and um, make up for those people who were on strike, and that would cost them a lot of money. So now that now that this process is in place, the costs are lower, and uh, of course that improves the aggregate supply. 
Um, investing in more and better education, well, that's something we've talked about a lot, and I'm sure you've talked about a lot, a lot in class with Mr. P. And obviously, um, uh, better, more productive workers leads to a improvement in aggregate supply. Finally, uh, some tax changes. So the government is always looking at ways that um, they can change the tax rules um, to create an incentive for people to come to work. So to um, to uh, you know, so provide uh, some tax relief for people who are just coming into the workforce um, or who are on low incomes um, to encourage them to you know move away from the dole and come into work. Now, what does this do? Well, this this increases the, the number of available workers in the market and uh, obviously that reduces costs for firms and uh, once again leading to an increase in aggregate supply. So uh, if we just move on and summarize what we've just talked about then looking at this next graph here. Um, so we've got we've got supply side policies impacting on product markets, impacting on labor markets. The ultimate effect of both of those is to reduce costs. There we go here. All have the effect of reducing costs and increasing profit. As you can see, if you follow the line, uh, that leads to a shift in aggregate supply to the right. Um, so there it is there, leads to an increase in aggregate supply, which clearly leads to an increase in GDP. And we all know that to mean that is growth in the economy. Okay, so I just want to run you through a, uh, a question from a previous exam paper, and I think this might be from a couple of years ago. It relates to the Reserve Management Act, the RMA, and uh, once again, you'll be starting to get pretty familiar with this, this particular uh, Act of Parliament. Uh, it wants to know how um, an amendment to the uh, the resource the RMA may have a positive effect on economic growth, and the amendment relates to if I just scroll up the page a little bit. The amendment relates to um, uh, making it easier for firms to gain resource consents. So the government has has made the uh, the rules or the regulations a little bit less demanding, if you like. So let's have a look at how we might answer this question. Now. Uh, over to the left here, I've written the letters DER. Now you may or may not remember, I've talked about it a bit, but what we what I'm talking about there is a sort of a, an exam answering strategy. DER stands for Define, Explain, and Relate Back to the question. So let's see if I've manage to do that in this situation. So the two points we have to cover, how the delays may have affected firms in the first place and how the change or the faster consents are going to improve the situation and lead to economic growth. Okay. So define, what have I said? The RMA is designed to protect the natural environment from the extremes of economic development. Firms must abide by the RMA if what they intend to do will affect the environment. Okay, so that little first few lines there is my define. Now, let's pick up on these two points here. One, two. Firstly, how have delays Im impacted? Well, delays caused by the RMA will mean that firms cannot get a new business or a new business investment up and running and producing income. Pretty important there, yeah, producing income. Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? If you do a new investment or start a new business, you want it to start making money. Not that I want you to say that, but that's the idea of it. Producing income is better, is better terminology. And they want to do that as fast as they can. So in this case, if they can't do that, then this could result in less profit, less profit here, uh, being made short term, and, and importantly, even less incentive. So firms go, oh, I can't be bothered, there's too much hassle, I'm not going to bother doing the investment. Okay. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, how the faster consents could make a difference. Well, I've just gone on to say here, faster consents will improve the situation 
and will provide increased incentives and lower costs in the process. This will lead to firms growing and supplying more goods and services. Okay, So, increased incentives and lower costs, pretty key words here, and leading to more firms growing and supplying more goods and services. All right. So there is my explain. Right down to there. Explain. Now, let's relate back to the question. Now, remember the question said um, in bold letters up the top here, if I just scroll up a little bit, and have a positive effect, a positive effect on economic growth. Okay, so there's our explain. That's what we need to do for the explain. Let's have a look at it. This will result in a right-hand movement of the AS curve, which will lead to an increase in real GDP. So pretty critical here. A right-hand movement, or a move out if you want to say that, that would be okay, of the AS curve, which will lead to an increase in real GDP. Remember real GDP is along the bottom uh, axis of the model, which is known as growth in the economy. Growth in the economy. And finally, that there is our explain. So that's sort of a strategy or a style of um, question answering which has been pretty popular over the last few years. And sorry, that's not explain, isn't it? That's relate back. Um, relate back. And yeah, popular um, answering technique which I encourage you to get used to um, practicing in your exam preparation. Okay, hope that was helpful.